This is Jeremy Clark of jeremybytes.com, and today we're going to start a new series about task and await in C Sharp. We're going to be focusing on consuming asynchronous methods, and this way we can get comfortable with how things work, and this will get us prepared so that we can start writing our own asynchronous methods in the future. So let's just review a little bit of history. We've had several different asynchronous patterns in the past, and some of these were easier to use than others, and some are more powerful than others. We started out with the asynchronous programming model, or APM. This was method-based, and we usually had pairs of methods, such as begin get data and end get data. And then in order to tie these together, we would use this iAsync result. Unfortunately, this was a little difficult to work with. But then things got a little bit easier. We had the event asynchronous pattern, or EAP. This was method and event based. And the advantage of this is if you could hook up an event handler, you could use this pattern pretty easily. So generally there's a method such as get data async that would kick off our asynchronous process. And then we would have an event that we would hook up to when that process was finished. And if we needed any data out of that process, it would come back in the event args from that event handler. Now this was easy to use, but it was pretty limited in what we could do with it. So then we got the task asynchronous pattern, or TAP. As you can imagine, this is task-based. And generally the way this works is that we have a method that uses a task as a return value. So here we have a method called getDataAsync, and it actually returns us a task. Now what is a task? Well, a task represents a concurrent operation. What's important to understand is this may or may not happen on a separate thread. Now the examples we'll be looking at today will be on a separate thread, and we'll be able to see that when we run our application. Now what makes this pattern great is the extreme flexibility that we get with this. We can chain tasks together, we can combine them into single operations, we can have a parent task spawn multiple child tasks. So this will work with pretty much anything that we need to do with asynchronous programming. So let's head over to our code and see how we can consume a method that uses the task asynchronous pattern. So here we are in Visual Studio, and we have a fairly simple application set up. Well, I say simple, but there is kind of a complex infrastructure behind it. I want to consume some asynchronous methods, so I have some services in place that will make it easier to do that. Let's start by running our application. Now here we see we have a fairly simple UI. We have a fetch data with task button, a fetch data with await button, and a clear data button. And then on the right hand side we have our list box. And right now these buttons don't have any effect at all. So let's go to our library and take a look at the asynchronous method that we're going to consume. For that we'll look at our person repository class. And in this case we'll be using the get method. Now notice the get method does return a task. In fact, it returns a task of list of person. This is one of the things that makes tasks interesting to deal with. We often end up with nested generic types. But all this is saying is that eventually we will get a list of person back from this task. And if we take a look at our person object, we see that it's a very simple class. It just has five properties, an ID, a first name, a last name, a start date, and a rating. And we also have an override of the toString method. Now the contents of this particular method itself aren't important. One thing I want to point out is this await task.delay3000. What this will do is pause operation for three seconds. This works very similar to a thread.sleep, but the difference is thread.sleep will block the current thread while task.delay does not. And again, the rest of this method isn't important at this point. What we're doing is calling into a web API service. So let's go to our application where we can actually consume this get method. For that, I'm just going to look at the code behind of our main form. Now I am keeping things simple here so that we can focus on the asynchronous aspects of this application, but normally I would split things out between my presentation layer and my UI layer. What we see now is that I do have some event handlers set up for our buttons, the fetch with task button underscore click, and our fetch with await button underscore click. Another thing to note is I do have a class level field for our person repository. So this is how we can access that get method that we just looked at. So let's go ahead and start exploring our code. So for this, I'm going to say repository.get and take a look at what we get back from this method. Now we know we do have a return value from this. So I'm gonna start out simple and just say var result 
equals repository.get. Then I'm going to let Visual Studio help me out a little bit. If we hover over var, what we see is this does return a task of t result. And if we look, we see that t result is actually a list of person. So result is in fact a task of list of person. To try to make things a little clearer, I won't use var, and we'll go ahead and say task of list of person here. And I'll go ahead and change the name of result to people task. So this represents a task that will return us a list of person objects once it completes. Now at this point, you might be tempted to do something like people task dot result. If we look at what result is, we see that it represents the list of person. Now it's very tempting to use this directly. But the problem is, if we call people task dot result, this will stop processing on this thread until that result returns. And what that will do is it will lock up our UI. So instead of accessing this directly, what I want to do is I want to set up what's known as a continuation. So I'll say people task dot continue with. And what this means is that after my task is done processing, I want it to perform another action. And in fact, if we look at the parameters for this, we can see that the primary one is an action of task of list of person. And this is where some people will turn around and run the other way. But this actually isn't that difficult. An action is a built-in delegate type. And all it does is it represents a method that returns void. Now the generic type on this action, which happens to be task of list of person, that's the parameter that's coming into this method. If you want some more information on delegates, I do have a video series on C Sharp delegates, and you can learn all about action and funk in there. But let's go ahead and create a method for this. So again, this will return void, and we'll call this populate list box, since that's what we'll be doing inside this method. And again, the parameter that we need for this is a task of list of person. And I'll go ahead and just call this t for right now for task. And now that I have this method signature in place, I can go ahead and put this into the parameter of our continue with method. Now I do need to get to the list of person that's inside of our task, so I'll say t.result. Now I know I told you not to use task.result earlier, but here it's actually safe. Because this is being called with the continue with, that means this method will not be run until after that first task has completed. That means the result property will be populated and we can use it safely. Now there are a few exceptions to that, such as if the process is canceled or we get an exception during that process, but we'll be exploring those in later videos. So again, t.result is a list of person. So let's go ahead and just create a variable for that. So we'll just create a list of person called people and we'll set that equal to t.result. Now we can just use that variable to populate a list box. So we'll just say for each var person and people, person list box dot items dot add person. So we'll just loop through each of the items in our collection and add them to our list box. So now that we have this in place, it seems like our application should work. So let's go ahead and run our application and then click on our fetch data with task button. Now again, we do have to wait three seconds for that delay to come back. And what we see is we actually get an exception at this point. And let's take a closer look at what the exception says. The calling thread cannot access this object because a different thread owns it. Now this will look familiar to anyone who's done threading on their own. What we have is a situation where we're on one thread and we really need to be on a different one. Now the reason for that is that when we create the task, again in this case it actually creates a separate thread different from our UI thread. And when we do our continuation, it will continue to operate on that same thread. Now inside our continuation, we are trying to access a UI element, our person list box, but that's owned by the UI thread, not the thread that we're on. So in the old days, what we would do is use dispatcher.invoke in order to marshal this process across the threads. But that's something we definitely don't want to do today. So let's see what we can do to fix this. So we'll just stop debugging. And you might have noticed when we looked at continue with, it has a number of overloads, 40 in fact. That means that there's some options that we can use. Now, I don't wanna look through all of these, so I'm gonna jump ahead. I know that we actually want overload number seven. 
And notice what we have here, a task scheduler. So I'm just going to say task scheduler dot from current synchronization context. Now let's talk a little bit about what that means. What I'm saying here is that when we run the continue with task, I want it to use the same task scheduler that I'm currently on when I create this continue with. Now what's the task scheduler? That's what figures out when to run the tasks, what thread to run them on, and so forth. Now I'm actually calling this continue with method inside the click handler of our button. That means that I'm calling this from the UI thread. So what I'm specifying is please run this task on the UI thread. And with this one change, we'll see that our application now behaves the way we expect it to. So when I click on the fetch data button, we'll wait our three seconds and then we'll see that our list box is populated. Now I'm someone who loves Lambda expressions. And whenever I see an action or a func, I treat that like a big flashing sign that says, put your Lambda expression here. So I actually want to inline this code. So I'm going to copy the parameters and the method body of our method. And then up here, instead of saying populate list box, I'm going to paste. And then in between the parameters and the method body, I'm going to add our goes to operator that turns this into a Lambda expression. And let's just indent things a little bit here to line things up. So now I have a Lambda expression that takes a task of list a person as a parameter and then performs the action that we specify by populating our list box. Now I do like the syntactic sugar that we get with Lambda expressions, and one of those is parameter type inference, which means if the compiler can figure out the type of the parameter, I don't have to put it in there. In addition, if I only have one parameter, I don't need parentheses around it. Now what's great about this is our parameter T is still strongly typed, so we can see it is a task of list of person. But the compiler can figure that out based on where we're using this, so we don't have to type it in explicitly. And if we run our application, we'll see that it behaves exactly the same way it does before. And just to show that the UI thread isn't being blocked, after I click the button, I'm going to move our UI around. So we can see our UI is still responsive in that intermediate period before our task actually returns. And then back in our code, since we have our Lambda expression, I can get rid of this separate method that we created earlier. So this shows how we can interact with the task to take full control over this asynchronous process. But we can do this with much simpler syntax now. And for that, we use the async and await keywords. Let's take a quick look at those. So you might have seen async and await in different methods in code. What this does is it creates a syntactic wrapper around the task so that we don't have to go through quite as much ceremony when we're using this. When we write the code using async and await, it looks like we're writing synchronous code. But in fact, once we hit the await keyword, our method will pause until the task completes. And the great thing about this is even though it looks like a blocking operation, it does not block our current thread. Now you might be wondering about the async keyword. This is really just a hint to the compiler. If we write async on our method, it doesn't magically make our method asynchronous. What this does instead is it tells the compiler how to treat the await keyword. Now the reason we have this is await is a new keyword that was added to the C-sharp language. And we don't want to break any existing code. So if we don't have async, then await will be treated just like any other identifier that we use in the language. But if we add async to the method, then await will be treated so that it becomes this asynchronous process that we want to use here. So let's head back to the code and take a look at how we can use this. And for this, we'll fill in our other event handler, fetch with await button underscore click. Now the reason I kept these as two separate buttons is so that we can compare the code once we're finished with this. So again, we want to use repository.get, but this time let's take a closer look at what Visual Studio is telling us here. So this does tell us that it returns a task of list a person like we saw before, but notice that this is also tagged as awaitable. And in fact, it gives us the usage below. So list of person X equals await get. So let's go ahead and try this. We'll start by creating a variable for the return type, which will be called people. And then we'll use the await keyword. 
Now notice Visual Studio is not happy with us at this point. And if we take a look at the error message, it says the await operator can only be used within an async method. And then it tells us exactly what we need to do. Consider marking this method with the async modifier and changing its return type to task. Now I won't be talking about the return types in this video, but we'll be looking at that in future episodes. For now, we'll just say private async void. And when we do that, notice that the await keyword lights up and our red squigglies go away. And if we look at the type for our people variable, we'll see it is a list of T and that T is in fact a person object. So again, let's be a little more clear and just say list of person in this case. So now that we have our list of person, let's just use it like we did before. So we'll for each var person in people. And then we'll say person list box dot items dot add person. And when we look at this code, it looks like synchronous code. So we call clear list box, then we call repository dot get, put its value into the people variable, and then we just for each over that and put it into our list box. But that await keyword makes all the difference in the world. Let's go ahead and run our application. And when I click on fetch data with await, again, we'll have to wait those three seconds that we have delayed. And then we see that our list box is populated. And just like with our task, in that interim period, our UI does still stay responsive. So we do see this is running asynchronously. So we have two different ways of getting the same results. We can use the task directly and take full control over the continuation, or we can use the await keyword and let the compiler handle things for us. As we can see, using the await syntax is much, much easier. And in fact, we didn't have to worry about the task scheduler or what thread we were on either. Now you may be wondering why I spent so much time talking about task when there's an easier way of doing it. And the reason is that await will not fulfill all of our needs. There are situations where we'll want to take more control over the process. For example, we may want to have multiple child tasks that all run at the same time, or we may just want a little more control over the cancellation process. The main reason I show it is because the first time we see async and await, it really looks like magic. If we don't understand what's going on behind the scenes, then we might be tempted to simply sprinkle async and await throughout our code and just hope that everything works right. But if we have a good understanding that behind this is a task and it has certain context that it runs in, then we have a better chance of coming up with a fix if something goes wrong. And that's the basics of consuming asynchronous methods with either task or async await. Now in future episodes, we will be looking at some more details of this, including additional functionality such as how to handle exceptions and how to do cancellation with an asynchronous process. Until then, be sure to follow the links in the video notes and that will take you to the code samples as well as a series of articles on this topic. And of course, for more information, be sure to visit www.jeremybytes.com. We'll see you next time.